Welcome everybody to our first ever equestrian performance round table. We cannot wait to share some ideas, some suggestions, some knowledge with you over the next 30 minutes or so. And we have got four exceptional guests around the table for you today. And I'm going to start by the man who has come up with this idea, Tony Sandoval. Tony, just tell us what this round table is all about, because it was an idea I know you had a couple of months ago. We've worked together during lockdown and, and spoken a lot about this, but just fill everybody in. What is it all about? Thanks, Nicole. So this round table is basically the start of hopefully a community in where writers can come in and get professional advice, suggestions, ideas on how to properly train, how to uh, eliminate hopefully injuries and pretty much to have like a source like where they can come in and feel like everything is tailored towards them. All the information is tailored towards making them a better writer and interacting with other people that are also on the hunt for this information. So that way it can be a place where again, people just come in and feel safe about expressing what they're dealing with. And that they know that all the information that they're getting is coming from credible sources. Yeah, absolutely. And, the, and I am sure there is going to be some healthy discussion about all of you because you all have different expertise and different areas of interest as well. Um, Tony, for anybody that hasn't come across you, Coach Sando, I always want to refer to you as Coach Sando. Tony <laughs> sounds very unnatural coming off my tongue. Um, just tell us a bit about you. You're based in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I am a Kentucky-based strength and conditioning coach, um, and I specialize in equestrian sports performance and I've been doing that for about four years now and I work from anywhere from pony pony club young riders uh, adult ami all the way to professional and I have worked with various disciplines on trying to get them to improve their riding by keeping them healthy safe strong and then helping them create some routines that'll get them in the right state of mind. So I don't want to say mental training or anything that has to do with sports psychology. It's more about how to go about becoming more consistent with their performance. Yeah, that's very fair. Um, Jenny Douglas, you are based in the UK. As a, we're, we're literally from all four corners of the world, I think. The, the world doesn't have corners you know what I mean um Jenny you are based in the UK you are event fit rider performance just tell us a bit about yourself as well thank you Nicole and thank you Tony for inviting me on today yes yeah, so my name is Jenny um I am a senior lecturer in sport and exercise science at a university in Gloucestershire um but I also own event fit which is an online equestrian sports performance platform and very much like Tony it's based around sort of strength conditioning services and the business really sort of took off exponentially, if you like, when I started to include athlete mindset and started to work on person first, athlete second mentality. Um, so I really sort of enjoy doing that. And a lot of my practitioner based work is, is sort of um, academically evidenced. So my PhD okay. is looking at the physiological demands of, of event riding and physical characteristics in horse riders. So I kind of carry that through with my students and we work on things like women's health, menstrual cycles and females and such forth. So yeah, that's oh, cool. what I'm doing. Excellent. Um, we will go to Australia next. Tash Gunston. Tash, you are the eventing physiologist. We will go through where you can find everybody on social media a bit, little bit later. Whereabouts in Australia are you, Tash? Because it's very early in the morning when we're recording it this. Is, it is uh, 10 to 5 this morning. Oh, and God, that's oh bless I'm you. <laughs> I feel really guilty now. <laughs> No, no, it's all good. It's all good. Um, so I'm from just north of Brisbane in Queensland, uh, and I've been I've lived here my whole life. Um, and I graduated uni in about 2014 in exercise physiology, and I initially went out into a allied health setting, working with chronic disease management and clients there. And then just recently have combined my two loves of my job and equestrian and eventing and created a, a rider biomechanics based uh, 
business as well as exercise prescription for for clients to help them improve themselves in the saddle and out of the saddle because I think it's really important to do both um, and um, that's sort of where I've started off on um, so I think it's really important for people to enjoy exercise and and feel comfortable doing it um, so I'm really I try to promote that, that everyone has specific exercises they can do and, and it's not all, not all one size fits all. So that's definitely what I, I believe. Absolutely. Um, last, but by no means least, uh, near Salt Lake City, I believe in Utah, Lisa Barman, OM Rider Performance. Lisa, thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, so yeah, as as most of you guys are, uh, the interest in this roundtable is just very exciting to increase rider performance. And um, my background is that I'm a professional rider, trainer, and coach. So I compete professionally. I've been training adults and their horses and young riders. And recently, within the last few years, started integrating uh, yoga for riders to try to bridge the gap yeah, between um, more of a holistic approach as well as, as competition goals. Because a lot of times what we were finding was that there are a rider or a horse imbalances and looking for ways to try to balance that out for long-term partnerships. Most riders and trainers are quite broken. And so we're trying to have a more preventative approach to, again, a long-term situation. So I I'm really excited. I think this is going to be one of the things that we're going to come on to a little bit later on in the show, prevention slash cure, because there's a lot of things people can do um, to sort of stop problems occurring, but also that we're going to talk specifically on this show about lower back pain in equestrian riders, because it is something that is so common. And we're going to talk about a few of the reasons why it's there, um, how you can do things to help improve it. Um, we're going to go into a few of the technical areas as well about sort of saddles, stirrups, that sort of thing. Let's start with the why. Tony, why is lower back pain so common in the equestrian world? So if you think about this analogy in across other sports, if you've played other sports, you'll understand that there's always a, a preseason. There's always a time where you take to train and to uh, get your body acclimatized to the amount of work that you're gonna need to do for your sport. So there's conditioning, training, there's all types of things that you can go through to prepare your body for work. What I see happening is that a lot of people bypass that. So they can get their horse ready but as far as logging in hours to physically get themselves ready for the amount of work, that, that is where I feel is so much more, I guess, area of development that an, a rider should be doing. Because once you get into the point where say you haven't been riding for a while and then you go on and then now you're riding, say you have two horses, say you have three horses, but you're riding for a long time, it's just a matter of time before your body starts to break down because it wasn't used to the amount of work. So there is no proactive approach because only because there's no back pain, that means I'm fine. But there's no thought process on to how do I stay fine? How do I prepare myself just like a horse would? It's not like a horse goes from getting turned out to getting, okay, let's come on in, tack you up, and now you're off and running. There's always a thought process towards the horse's training, but that same thought proce process is lacking when we talk about the rider. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, you mentioned that we would never dream of just getting our horses in from the field and just going, right, I'm off to a competition right. without the necessary preparation. And yet we do it with ourselves. We wouldn't necessarily warm up ourselves for a competition. Tony, I know that's certainly one of your key points, um, but we would always do it for our horses. And Lisa, I'm sure you have seen this in your career that if somebody has something and they just think, do you know what, something's not quite right with their horse, they, there's a niggle, but they can't quite put their finger on it. They get the appropriate person out to come and have a look in the blink of an eye. And yet if it's themselves, they just put up and shut up, don't they? Oh, absolutely. And, and in some ways it's, it's even a bit glorified to do that, right? Like we, <laughs> we, we put a little hero status to the riders that like put some duct tape on and get on and keep going. And you're like, However, you wouldn't, yeah, again, you wouldn't, you're correct. You would not do that with your horse. 
um, I, I also think it's quite reflective on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, um, having a training program and you watch your riders and the riders, literally they're going through their head, like I was late, my boss yelled at me and blah, 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 blah. They get on the horse, they just go straight to riding. They warm their horse up for 15 minutes every ride, but they themselves had, have done nothing prior to getting in the tack to prepare for their ride. And I think that's one of the great things about this group that we can help that, that approach. And, and it's about talking about it as well, raising mm -hmm. awareness, just kind of knowledge, understanding. You don't have to be an expert to, to either listen to this show and get something from it because it is all about sharing that knowledge. Um, and listeners, I am very much, these four people know their stuff. I'm clinging on to every word. So let's start with a few of the questions that we have been sent in across all of our social media platforms. We asked you what you would like to know about lower back pain. And we've had a real array. I'm not sure we're going to get through all of them on this show because there's quite a lot of them, but we'll see what we can do. Um, let's start with, um, should we go with the biomechanics side of things? So is back pain a biomechanics problem or from lifting incorrectly or using your back incorrectly? Tasha, I'm going to come to you first on that one. Is it something biomechanical or is it something that can be prevented there? Well, it kind of comes into both of those two things and you can kind of use them as the same thing. So people can be biomechanically incorrect, which then causes them to lift incorrectly um, and then causes issues and, and a trauma where the load's been placed on the spine too excessively. Or then you can be anatomically slightly incorrect to start with. Then when you do lift what you think is correct, it's actually still not utilizing the correct muscles. So it, it can be a little bit of both. Um, unfortunately, there's also the non-specific lower back pain, which sometimes hasn't really even got a cause. So that, one, that one's a great one to also tell people that you go, well, actually, I'm not quite sure how this is, but I think it could be blah. And so that, that's what, what people love to hear when they haven't got a reason. Um, but yes, definitely it's something that you need to look into, whether being in the saddle or off the saddle, what your, your patterns are, how you move and how, how efficiently your body works and whether there's weaknesses. A lot of the time uh, we have compensatory muscles that like to take over where they're not actually doing their correct job and they're not actually doing the jobs that say the glute should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then it places a lot of strain on the rest of the body. So when we look at us in the saddle, uh, when we look at us standing or wherever, in an anatomical position, our spine has natural curvatures. Um, so we have a curvature at the, um, the cervical spine, we have a curvature through the thoracic spine, the opposite direction, and then a little one down through the lumbar. And what can happen is we can have excessive or exaggerated curves, or we can be a bit too straight through the spine as well. And then that can affect in each individual vertebrae and then the discs underneath them that then loads up um, and is supposed to be our shock absorbers. So when we, we look at us in the saddle, um, our, our discs are, are supposed to be there for absorbing the motion of the horse and creating a, a perfect picture and a perfect position in the saddle. And if we maybe uh, exaggerated too much in opposite directions or too straight, the, the discs then don't have that ability to absorb as much, but then also the musculature around those supporting structures are also not working that great. So then all of a sudden, if we have inefficient movement in a certain area, that then creates too much movement or excessive movement in other areas where they don't need to be loaded that well. So that can then cause a, a lot of problems later down the track as well. Um, so when we then look at the, the pelvis and, and sitting in the saddle in, with our, our hips and our pelvis, we, we want to be able to absorb and move with the horse but then all of a sudden, if we're not able to freely move the hips and, and we're not anatomically correct there or uh, efficient, then um, we, we can get um, quite blocked and then a lot of load goes through the spine. So specifically for horse riding, a lot of the time it can be biomechanical that, that we, we, need, we can correct and we can fix both in the saddle and out of the saddle. So I think that's really important for people to realize that not everything can be fixed out of the saddle and not everything can be fixed off the horse either. Oh, sorry, that was the same thing. 
<laughs> we know what you mean. It's the it's the understanding, isn't it, of trying to find out what the root of the problem is rather than exactly. sort of taking a stab in the dark. Um, okay, uh, core strength. Does that help make be- pain better or worse? I'm guessing, Tash, that kind of links into what you're just saying, that the stronger you are, the more prepared your muscles are to take, if you've prepared them in the correct way, then they are more um, capable of withstanding the pressures that they're going to be put under. So Lisa, how does that work? Can it also go the opposite way as well? And that actually you're so strong, it can make it more painful. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, to, to add and to carry on with what Tosh was saying, if you think about the movement in the horse, creating a, a shock wave of movement, essentially, um, if your alignment isn't quite right, so whether you're uh, you're out of alignment or you're too tight in some areas, that stock wave can't keep moving. So for example, if you're trying to absorb and go with the movement on your horse, if you're locked up, let's say and your shoulders are hunched forward, that, that energy is not gonna be able to go all the way up through your body, right? If your core or your back is so strong that you're just in this really tight, very, very upright, correct, like rigid, uh, rigid movement, what'll happen is that the horse's back is moving and you're just like this on them. So what you're looking for is a combination between uh, alignment, strength, uh, alignment, strength, and and flexibility so that you can keep your body soft in some places and um, controlled in other places. Otherwise you get um, what we call kind of the, the bobblehead effect you know, where you see the rise, and I'm guilty of this as well, where everything's correct, the head's doing this, right? Because the energy has to go somewhere. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to keep it going in the right places. Okay, that's very fair. Jenny, anything to add from you on those points? Yeah, so I guess like for me, when I'm thinking about back pain, if I think about it as simple, in a simplistic form as I can express it, it's usually from my point of view anyway, caused by poor range of motion around the hips, misalignment or pelvic tilt and trunk stability, or should we say instability. And so sometimes we get this stick to me between strength and mobility, because what happens is if somebody is in pain, they will have like an involuntary descending neural control and they'll end up guarding and becoming more tonic. So what we'll end up seeing is actually slightly more guarded position And that's where we start to see things like hip flexor tightness, glute inhibition, and actually the rider will sometimes report more pain than they're actually in because they've got this inhibition in the neural pathways. And so sometimes they end up becoming more concerned about the pain that they're in and guard themselves, which then causes them more pain because they're actually switching off the muscles that are preventative of it. Mm -hmm. So my role on the floor is then to try and work with them as a professional to manage their beliefs and get them to trust me that actually we need to work on both their mobility and the strength off the horse because we need to work on their mobility so that they can get the right range of motion to fire the glutes or fire the muscles that have essentially gone a bit tired, turned themselves off and then strengthen them back up so that we don't get that cascade of, of just like protecting ourselves, which is essentially what we're doing. So we get protective, uh, areas in the posterior chain, hamstrings, we also get it in the hip flexors. So for me, trunk strengthening and endurance exercises can normalize the firing patterns in the gluteal muscles and obviously other muscles and decrease spinal motion, which we were talking about that sort of like, uh, att- like lack of attenuation in the spine. Um, so we do lots of like anti-rotation, anti-extension exercises, which you'll see loads on Tony's page. Um, you see loads of examples of these types of exercises that you can do. So we really want to make sure that we've got spinal control and we do that in different ways, depending on your athletic development or where you are in your athletic development. And, and some of it is that attenuate that, that um, absorption of force and the, the, the ability to learn how to do that. And it's quite difficult to learn how to do that when you're on something else that's moving and you're more worried about not falling off of it. And that's where practicing those patterns of absorbing force through the ankles, knees, hips and elsewhere. Uh, so things like, you know, landing mechanics and things that Antonio and I have talked about this a lot. And so sometimes that athletic preparation, it doesn't have to be so complicated. It, it's sometimes a little bit more simple, simple than we express, I think, sometimes. So for me, it's about giving you a good range of motion in your joints, making sure you're nice and strong, 
and actually supporting you through that process because if you're hurting you're going to guard and it's going to hurt even more so it's just yeah. about really working with that person and, and getting them through the first stages and not going gung-ho oh you've got a you know back pain let's go straight for the heavy core stuff and maybe we need to get them a bit more mobile first before we go go in there guns blazing <laughs> with yeah, the strength stuff. definitely absolutely agree um Okay then. So if we, if somebody is is having issues with their back, obviously they're they're, they're in some pain. The idea. No. Mm. We'll just wait for her. I think she. <laughs> Everybody's still going, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure Nicole will figure it out. Everybody was making great points. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody was making well, amazing points. I, don't know. I think until we wait with her, I think everybody is in consensus that when we talk about biomechanics, Lisa's mm -hmm. points about energy absorption or being able to have this this um, ability to have the tools needed to ride properly. Jenny was obviously pointing out all the things that we needed to do as, or what has to happen within the body, within the organism to be able to ride. We can all agree it's all about preparation. Right. It's, it, the mm -hmm. riders are very, very quick to point out, it must be the saddle, it must be my stirrups, it must be something but never look at what we all are saying in our own ways, preparation. Are you, can you do A, can you do B, can you do C? Because when you start doing this sport, it has um, a certain level of requirements physically that people mm -hmm. try to, that have been bypassing for a long time because it's a, it's a cultural thing. I'm the newest person into this field, but when I look in with fresh eyes, I go, wait, it is a badge of honor to follow what your trainer has done, which followed what their trainer had done. But now we are living different. We are on mobile phones more. We are at computers, watching TV. So the same organisms that are present now were not the same organisms that the trainer's trainer's trainer that they learned this strategy from had been probably passed on this information. Now it's our, I think, responsibility to say, okay, now, now that doesn't work. Now, in order to prevent all of these things that are going on, we have to be able to physically prepare off saddle, learn the right biomechanics of movement within your own body. Can you, can you do some basic squatting, lunging, pressing, pulling, carrying heavy stuff? Going with a trainer that understands the, the process or the level that you are at physically, that way they can prescribe you the right type of teach, the right type of program that you should be going through in what physical abilities you have that way with preparation and great training you're gonna at the end of the day be a little bit more well be set up for success does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah no, absolutely. definitely i think and when you look at other sports around around the world and you've got the institutes of sports that that are so proactive about the next best thing and the, and the next research and um, and the next scientific thing that's going to improve your performance. Our our sports definitely a bit more lacking in that, and it's it's a little bit frustrating sometimes as someone that that is so passionate about that then to go, why aren't we so proactive? Um, and and you're right, we're definitely a traditional based sport that we go well. Our coach did that or our mum's grandmother did this this way, so this is how we do it. But also then you look at our sport and we don't ever switch off. So we uh, so we ride say 45 minutes an hour um, and that's our, our training, but then we've got to tack up beforehand um, and, and hose off afterwards. We're cleaning stables constantly. We all the other yard work and, and uh, uh, facility work also is loading on our body as well and we we don't tend to care about that or we don't tend to care about how we're doing things off the saddle as well with just things that we need to do because of that's guaranteed well that's what we have to do with our horses we have to look after them as well 
So I think people don't realize that we don't just spend our, our hours in our week training. We also spend a lot of our hours in our week mm. doing all these other things that come as, as normal activities of daily living, but they, they are still loading on their body and, and we need to make sure that we are working efficiently and effectively so that we can facilitate the best performance when we are on the horse. So we're not fatigued, but also then that we're utilizing the correct muscles um, on the horse as well as off the horse. Yeah. yeah. No, I, hey, Nicole. I, I've come <laughs> back. Sorry, team. Sorry. Sorry to I, you I had off, a slight Lisa, technology fail and <laughs> I have resorted to my phone. So sorry about that. Um, I, I missed that completely, but um, I, I'm sure it was very brilliant. But to catch me up. So have, have you done the back support bit or have we... Oh, we we move on. No. We're talking about our own thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's fine then. That's fine. No worries. Um, okay. Is there a place for back supports or is it better to get to the root of the problem, Tony, and fix it? Well, I think since I was just saying, I'm the one with the least amount of writing experience in this group, but with for talking about back supports, if I bring the experiences that I had from other sports, uh, putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound is just a matter of time before it all goes bad. And I hate to always um, sound very negative as far as what the, the habits are of riders and what they try to do to, I think Lisa made a point, to duct tape themselves together to be able to ride. Uh, there has to be a more in, uh, thought, thought out process onto what your body's trying to tell you. And, and how to really um, translate that into actions that you, should, you can take. If you need a back support to be able to ride, your brain is sending you messages that you're in pain. So while you're covering up one bullet wound with Band-Aid, there's gonna be another one that comes up. And then another one because you're just patching up holes and more are just gonna come out because you're not identifying the problem that the brain is telling you something is wrong we're going to start yeah. shutting off muscles. So, okay, you gave one, one group of muscle support. Now we're going to have to now adjust for that and maybe start messing around with something else, either up the chain or below the chain, right? Because the body can't just work by stabilizing like that for long. You might get away with it for one lesson because the body didn't have time to make the proper adaptations and compensations. But if you keep riding with that support, Believe me, the body will win every single time. The brain will win every single time and find other ways to help make you do that move. But it's not going to be the most efficient. It's not going to be the safest. It's just going to be because it, the body, the brain doesn't want you to die. And I know yeah. I'm going to the extent, but that's what the brain thinks. It only has a couple, a couple of real big duties. Keep you alive, procreate. It doesn't yeah. think about it doesn't think about how your writing is going to be and how you look like during dressage or when you're on, mm -hmm. you know, when you're doing any other type of activity. All it thinks about is those two and how can I make those two things happen? Yeah. Um, OK, so if you have got lower back pain and you're watching this and or any kind of pain, the answer is don't put a plaster on it or a band-aid on it. Go and have it looked at. Mm -hmm. uh, look at how you can make it better. Look at how you can get stronger because it is worth it in the long run. Um, let's move on to a couple of other questions. I really like this next question actually that, that's come in. Do technical stirrups help? Now we've seen a lot come onto the market in the last couple of years. They've become very popular. Is there a place for them, Jenny, in terms of that they're, they're proven to actually can help reduce lower back pain or the impact on your back? So I'll preface this with, I haven't ridden in any, and uh, this these questions, I got quite a lot of these questions from my own clients. So for those, I know that Lisa may have a little bit more experience with the actual use of them than me. So you can come from a practical maybe point, but I've done a bit of research. Um, that's what I like to do. So I've gone off and had a bit of a scurry around like a squirrel. And I tried to see if there's been anything done in this kind of area. So I found a couple of papers this year, um, that found that um, looking at um, jointed wide and fixed stirrups and looking at like junk angles and force production, there was no significant difference on either position or the forces experienced. 
by the by that group of riders. Now that doesn't mean that there is. That's obviously one sample population, but that study sort of suggested that that perhaps not. Um, there has been some research that has looked at um, maybe riding with shorter stirrups and using leg musculature to support you uh, is actually more protective for lower back pain. So that kind of suggests that that might be a, a, a riding style that you can adopt if you're trying to protect lower back pain. However, that isn't necessarily what you're going to want to do in a dressage test necessarily. And so, you know, um, I think the paper is kind of discussing the, the relative merits to some different populations. So if you're someone that does a lot of hacking, maybe you don't need to ride in such a, a long stirrup all the time, and maybe actually shortening the stirrup and leaving it in your back and using leg will help you. Um, but more than that, I think per, my personal view is that if you try jointed stirrups and they help you in some way, why not? <laughs> However, I don't think you want to use it as a crux because for me, as your strength coach, I would always encourage that you work on something that is going to have way more of an impact, like um, actually doing some protective stuff. So making sure that you're mobile, making sure your nutrition's right, your sleeping's right, that your body weight is correct, that you are working on your posture, you're not sitting down, all those things, way before I'd even be spending a fortune buying stirrups. And actually, um, one of the papers in the Journal of Strength Conditioning suggested that if you teach impact attenuation, so things like landing mechanics, absorption of force through the joints in the um, ankles, knees and hips, that's gonna serve you in terms of protecting lower back pain than stirrup will. So, if you've tried everything else and then you want to spend, I don't know how much these stirrups are, but I've heard they're a fortune. Probably, probably quite pricey. <laughs> then I, I personally would rather invest my money in a strength coach. <laughs> of course, I'm going to say that I'm biased. <laughs> and <laughs> um, that's probably what I would recommend. And then if you have the uh, finances to give it a go, why not? Um, placebos always help if, if they make us feel confident. So I wouldn't, say it was the most effective way to improve lower back pain. Okay. But. Fair enough. Lisa, any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and, and Jenny, I, I think you're, you're quite right. Um, my feedback on this is just from, again, from a more hands-on practical um, approach. I, I have not found there to be benefit to um, more technical stirrups as far as back pain. Um, I also agree that it's it's more positioning and alignment and strength more than the type of stirrup. Um, I what I have found is I do personally prefer a wider platform stirrup underfoot, um, but that's not necessarily because of you know what it does for your back. In that it creates a more stable platform for your foot to rest on. So that helps you maybe have more better alignment rather in the tack. Um, I'm quite anti the jointed stirrups for the same reason. If you, especially if you're in a jump position and you have a jointed stirrup that does this, it's quite hard to have a stable foot on that. Um, and what I found for most of my riders and certainly myself, if I'm experiencing lower back pain in a jump position or two point, it's usually because my knee is too tight or my ankle is not flexing. So what's happening is what's designed to be a shock absorber, your ankle or your knee not flexing is causing your back to then absorb the motion. So I know like, especially what Jenny just said that really focusing on strength and positioning is gonna be much more helpful long-term. Uh, but again, I, you know, I'm not on the marketing side of things. This is just what I have found to be helpful. Yeah, no, I think it's a very good point actually. Um, and from your perspective as well, you're also a qualified saddle fitter. Yeah. So talk to me about that because actually that has a, obviously everybody thinks about their saddles fitting their horse, but it's important that the saddle fits the rider too. Oh, correct. Absolutely. Um, you can you can fight your tack all day long and and never come out ahead, right? So one one of the really interesting things in the last couple of years has been studying materials in saddles. So from your actual saddle fit, there's there's a couple of different things that I've been looking at, and that that's the technical fit. Like, is it too tight? Is it a little forward? Is it a little back? Right? Because all of those things are going to affect your ability to stay in the middle in a balanced position and and your alignment to move with the horse. Um, what I've really been focusing on lately as well is the materials in the saddle. So things like are, are the saddles 
made of foam? Are they made of wool? And what type of shock absorbent ratios are involved in those things? And what we've we've been personally working on are materials that we're starting to use as a liner in between the saddle that is specifically designed to absorb different shock ratios and dis uh, disbursement patterns between the motion of the horse and landing. And that's, that's actually something we're, we're a project we're working on right now, which is, so it's really, really important to have a saddle that fits and that the materials may, that are in the saddle are designed to assist that, not counter assist not counter assist i like that expression of you can fight your tack all day long because it is very true it's got to work for both the horse and rider as a combination um we're rapidly running out of time so i'm just going to go for one more question um if there was one thing that you could either a piece of advice um or a exercise that you particularly love i'm going to come to each of you that you could pass on to anybody watching this what would it be that relates to lower back pain? And Tony, I'll come to you first. Uh, yeah, so I think the there is a group of exercises that one can do, but I think the take home point is just to be able to get into a strength training program. There's when we talk about absorption and being able to disperse energy, there's nothing that's gonna be just being able to have the strength, the foundation, to be able to do those type of things without thinking about it. So it doesn't, I think when, when I say, or when everybody says strength training, they just already take their brain into meathead, a lot of weight on their back or pulling a lot of weight from the floor. And although those things, yes, are a part of strength training, but what people have to understand is that everything has uh, the right type of application to the sport. So strength training is just being able to handle your body, being able to land and absorb or dissipate shock, being able to be have awareness so that when you have to make adjustments that you are strong enough to make those awareness awarenesses happen and make adjustments so that you can ride. So exercises that start off with body weight, like you should have a basic ability to be able to squat because it, depend, it, it, it allows you to have a good awareness of what's going on in your hips, your knees, and your ankles in relation to your thoracic spine. All those things happen in a squat and you would think, well, it's just for my booty or good legs. No, all those movements are training your body to be able to be handle all the things that happen when you're on the saddle. Lunging, lunging is gonna be taking you into different planes of movement, being able to pull things, push things with your upper body. You ha if you have good shoulder health, you'll even be able to press overhead and be able to have that good, shoulder retraction, protraction, elevation, and depression, right? So strength training is not just like one exercise. It's how we combine all the basic movements to be able to have the tools needed to help prevent things like back pain, shoulder pain, mid-back stiffness. And this is coming from a preventative. Like on, on a, if there's a triangle of performance and what support staff is, what their roles are, Strength training, strength and conditioning is at the foundation. And as you go up, then you start getting into, say we're talking about health here. Then you might go into someone like Tosh, that it, it, the strength training is there, but there's something still going on. Well, let's look at a biomechanist to understand the tools that you have and why they're not actually working. And then you probably get a little bit higher where you it's very narrow and there you, you should not be. But this is where, if you look at a triangle, this is where it's at. People go to physiotherapists first. Why? Because that's they're already hurt. So mm -hmm. at that point, you bypass me, you bypass someone like Tosh, and Tosh can obviously help with people that are hurt. But when you go to a therapist and that's your first call, it's because you didn't prepare and their job is to try to get you right, but it's a clinical, it's a, it's kind of like the last resort. That should, or I'm sorry, yeah, it should be your last resort, not your first. So to me, I, I really, really get fired up when people start there because it's not like those people are not, they don't know what they're doing. But at the end of the day, people like that are the gym guys that understand proper execution of exercises in all different manners and just are a very generalist. And then as you go up, you start getting more specific. That's the best way to do this. Can you squat? Just to kind of recap, I know I went on a little tangent there. Can you squat? Can you lunge? 
is your upper body able to, or one more, can you hinge? That means, can you bend at the hip? And then can you, your upper body push and pull and press? And can you carry heavy things? And if you're wondering where core comes into play, core is integrated into all those movements. So if you can start using your core within those movements, you don't have to isolate it. Your core knows how now to move as a, as a, as a part in the system. And those things carry over to something as specific as riding. Okay, so strength and prevention is better than cure overall. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, okay, very, very good points. Tash, how about you? Well, Tony, Tony definitely hit the nail on the head there with a lot of different things there. Biggest thing that I, I try to reiterate to people that do come to me with back pain is obviously they've they've got to a point where the pain is is there but it's it's not going to be magically cured overnight so it's persistence and it's kind of not pushing to pain but pushing through that with a bit of discomfort and having to work hard people do forget about that they have to actually work hard and put some effort in um but yes definitely trying to to realize that it's 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 going to take a lot longer to overcome patterns that might have been occurring for years and years and years to then put the work in and then um take a few months or even even up to 12 months even longer to actually continue to to adapt but also from that that you never stop to stop adapting unfortunately as we do get older things start to change anyway but we, we continually have to adapt with our body and adapt to the changes that are made through our physiological changes, but also our environment as well. But then from that also, I biggest thing I try to reiterate to patients when they do come in to see me for back pain is facilitating movement. A lot of the time people go, oh, my back's sore. I'm stopping moving. I'm, I'm going to put my feet up. I'm going to go lay in bed for days and days and days. So then all of a sudden their muscles are atrophying over their whole body, not just in their, their lumbar spine or where the injury is. And, and they don't then facilitate movement. They become more stiff, um, less agile. So the big thing that I do is just try to generate uh, and facilitate movement back into their body. And that doesn't have to be specific core strengthening or spinal strengthening. That can just be getting them going for a walk within their capabilities, getting them to do a few passive stretches um, and, and just trying to facilitate that. Um, also going from what Tony said, definitely the big thing is getting teaching people to correctly engage their core, but that doesn't mean giving them core exercises and doing Pilates. That, that means getting them to engage their core whilst they're doing functional activities functional activities that they do day in day out without even thinking about it so they become mm -hmm. more subconscious and more effective with their engagement of the correct muscles and and improve their overall function yeah i think that's a brilliant point and i love the hard work that as much as we would love there to be a magic wand there isn't yet um <laughs> not yet <laughs> Jen, not yet working on it working on it uh jenny how about you hey, two things i'll try and keep it succinct so the first thing i would say is athletic development um to ride well you need to be athletically primed so your conditioning so your fitness your mobility you need, to, you need to think of all these things your strength your reactivity your agility and what happens we see with like long-term rider development or athlete development we see a pattern of us hyperfixating on, the, on our sport really young and so we move away from other sports you see from school and we focus on equestrian because we have to because it's a lifestyle you know if your mom's bought you a horse or your dad's bought you a horse you're not gonna not go and look after it and so you don't have time for football you don't have time for hockey you don't have time for all the other things and so you sort of lose lose that that athleticism if you like and um i would encourage coaches parents to continue to facilitate their children to do other sports that are reactive that rose up require mechanics absorption change of direction get them in the, in not necessarily in the gym but like moving constantly doing the hinge squat not necessarily in a formal formal manner but like so they're regular doing these because you don't get that from horse riding and uh, i think it's really important not just for um lower back pain but general health uh, going forward so we know that increased time in the saddle and increased time doing yard tasks causes asymmetry and we know that asymmetry causes back pain so if you're not doing something to offset that, and if you have a period between the age of 10 and 20, and then suddenly you turn 20 and decide you're going to become a gym addict, 
you've lost 10 years of athleticism that is going to be really hard for you to retain. So that's my first one. Keep your kids active, not just on the horses. Secondly, would be to really consider the exercise versus training approach because it's a really hard thing I find for riders to get their heads around because they go through this kind of, a, not bipolar, but you know what I mean, like yo-yo fads. They do something, they stop doing something, they do something, they stop doing something. And then the training programme can never be a training programme because there's nothing, no consistency or no progression and they jump from one thing to another. And I would really say, you know, any, exercise is better than nothing, but if you just pop in a, a local, I don't want to, I won't call those names, but if you're just popping on a very popular YouTube person and watching them, whilst it's great for your general health, it's not necessarily going to make you a better rider. And I think you have to really, if you're listening to this, I'm going to assume you want to be a better rider. And therefore, I would really think about how you can be progressive in your training. So you're constantly moving ahead a little bit rather than losing a bit of weight, putting it back on. That's not correlated to performance at all. So that would be my two things. Thanks. Yeah, no, I think they're very, very good points. I find it really interesting that keeping your kids active in other sports, because actually it is so, riding is a lifestyle, isn't it? And mm -hmm. and it becomes all consuming. And actually that's not always the best thing long term. Um, Lisa, last, but by no means least, how about you? Yeah, no, I mean, what brilliant comments, you guys. And and I think everybody is speaking exactly what we need to hear. And and I think one of the biggest things from, from my perspective is that if you, again, if you're watching this, you're already interested, but just start. Don't get intimidated. Just start somewhere because yes, it is a lot of work and yes, it takes a lot of time, but anything you do is better than not doing anything. And the biggest thing that we can do to improve our riding are the things outside of the tack. And I think that's, a, that's an ideology that riders really need to understand. Um, one, of, one of the things I would love to see is that coaches in training programs and riding specific training programs are encouraging that type of awareness. Because like, for example, what we do is the first 10 minutes of every ride we do some yoga and it's, it's basic. It doesn't have to be a ton, but 10 minutes before you get on a horse will at least bring awareness to where you are that day. Cause I think that's one of the biggest things is first one, you have to be open to it. If you're here, you're open to it Two, You need to know what your balance issues are before you can really start addressing anything. So one very, so like a very simple simple, not necessarily easy, simple thing you can do before you hop on your horse is stand upright, nice and tall, close your eyes, lift one foot out in front of you, put that one down, lift the other foot. You're going to find that one of the, one of them is easier than the other, you know, or stand there, put your arms out, twist, and then twist back. And you're going to find one arm comes farther back than the other. And that doesn't take 20 minutes, but that will change the way that you think of your body and it'll change the way that you ride your horse. Because what you're gonna find is whatever shoulder of yours doesn't come back is probably the direction that your horse doesn't turn as well. And all of a sudden, then you're calling all the people on here to go, so it turns out my horse doesn't turn around. <laughs> my fault. My fault. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so it's just start there. And, and then we go down the rabbit hole with all of us because we'll be on next time too. We'll have all sorts of more ideas. I, I, do you know what? I think you have hit the nail on the head of that you, everybody has to start somewhere. And whether this is something that has interested you for years and something you're really passionate about, whether you've just got a bit of lower back pain and you want to make it better, whether you're a rider who wants to improve their performance because you want to get better and you want to improve your horse all of those things come together everybody starts somewhere so if you are interested anybody on on this group I'm sure would love to hear from you I'll very quickly just go around I think they'll be on on the screen at some point as well but just tell everybody where they can find you on social media um and by all means if you've got any questions send them in we'll be doing some more of these roundtable discussions as well so any other suggestions for topics, I think nutrition is going to be a really interesting one. I, I know a lot of people, Tony, have spoken to you about that one before. We've done a show on it um, and it sort of came up quite a lot. But any suggestions, send them in because we will talk about what you want us to talk about. Um, just quickly then, where can we find you all on social media? Uh, Tash, I'll start with you. So I'm on Facebook and Instagram with The Eventing Physiologist. 
or you can email me natasha at eventingphysiologist.com.au. Um, so that all that information or on my website, www.eventingphysiologist.com. I don't know if it's got .au. Maybe I'll just quickly check that. No, <laughs> dot, no, no <laughs> dot .au. I should probably know that. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's where you can contact me. Um, and most of the time I can get back to you within a few hours, I guess. But yeah, always open for questions, um, queries and any advice uh, from there. So that's me. Brilliant. Um, Jenny? You can find me on www.eventingfit.com. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook at eventfit underscore rider.performance. And you can email me at Jenny, J E N N I, at eventingfit.com. Brilliant. Lisa? You can find me at uh, OM Riding or ohm writing if that's easier to remember so the website is www.omwriting.com um, on facebook instagram email lisa at om writing and i'm pretty attached to social media unfortunately so i'm pretty quick <laughs> aren't we all aren't we all <laughs> um tony how about you uh you can go to my website www.coachsandotraining.com and on facebook and instagram uh at coach sandal training um and my email is tony at coach sandal training.com uh, and before i leave i just wanted to uh say that last question and how we all came together and address different points in my head i'm always thinking oh i should have said this and i felt like everybody was saying the things that i was thinking but didn't say but that's why i was thinking this is why this is why I wanted to get this together because everybody brings in the ideas that for some reason don't make it out of my head. And <laughs> I'm, I feel like supported, if that makes any sense. And maybe getting into my feelings a little bit, but it's like, it feels awesome that everybody here is, is thinks in, the, in a similar way in the sense of we're all trying to help riders uh, stay healthy and ride better. I think it's something that we need to see across the industry isn't it collaboration over competition of course we have to compete for competitive in an actual competition but that's yeah. we, we're yeah. all in this together everyone and and i think again this comes back to riding is different to other sports it is dangerous there is an element of danger to it and everybody respects that and there aren't many sports that you would go in and find competitors very most of the time um generously sharing opinions about the way how things on a cross country course ride in different lines and what they think about this. And that is something that is brilliant about equestrian sports and, and something that we really want to embrace. And, and so we want to make this a real community. Um, go and find everybody on social media. I'm at Nicole Brown Media, uh, nicolebrownmedia.com. Please don't send me any fitness <laughs> performance questions because I'm only gonna send them to these guys, but by all means, you could, you, you're more than welcome to come and say hi. Um, but guys, thank you all so, so much. Tashi, I'm so sorry that we got you up so early in the morning. Um, it's been <laughs> no, a very okay. long day it now. It was worth oh, it. Yeah, I've got to go the greater some good. horses and uh, go to work. <laughs> there we go. It is all for the greater good. A huge thank you to you all and a huge thank you to you guys at home for watching. We hope you've enjoyed it. There is more where this came from. So get in touch with any one of us with your suggestions and we'll be back very soon. But for now, the first equestrian performance roundtable has come to a close. Thanks for watching. <laughs>